What's up, guys? So I want to go over something. Um, one of my students said, you know, the way I teach or instruct high intensity training doesn't really resemble what you would see with Arnold or with um, Mike Menser, Dorian Yates. And I'm going to go over the reason why that is. Why does Dorian Yates' version of high intensity training <clears throat> look, and as well as Mike Menser's, why did they look so different from what I teach in terms of high intensity training? By the way, um, sale again, you're going to get the hit home workout and the uh, advanced arm training system if you get Golden Air system today. I normally do this sale every time I do a live stream. So, as you can see in the banner below, goldenairsystem.com, you get three programs. So, why does Mike Menser's, and it, you guys probably have seen Mike Menser's training videos. Um, Dorian Yates training videos back in the 90s. Why do they look so different? Why do they look so different from what I teach? Why am I teaching you to train so slow? And uh, the way their training appears to be kind of fast. So I'm going to go over kind of the history, why this happened. So I want to start off by saying Dorian Yates training, although it appears fast, by my standards, and appears relatively, you know, a lot sloppier um, than what, you know, I teach or I display. Compared to the rest of the bodybuilders, um, compared to the rest of the bodybuilders of the time, his form was very good. So what I'm going to show you is kind of the way a lot of the 80s and 90s bodybuilders trained back in the time, how sloppy it was. And then you'll be able to kind of see that um, Dorian Yates' form was a lot better. So, you know, Dorian Yates' form was considered strict back then. Um, but by today's standards, you know, we've learned a lot since, you know, the, the early mid-90s when Dorian Yates was competing. We've learned a lot about shearing forces and momentum and all that kind of stuff. And I'm going to go over where that came from. Um, and it's going to make sense why Dorian Yates didn't really incorporate really slow rep cadences. So first of all, I'm going to share my screen and, and show you kind of what training looked like um, around the time Dorian Yates was competing, uh, maybe not in the Mr. Olympia, but this is kind of a, a, a cool documentary, um, 80s documentary on bodybuilding. The first guy that show. First guy they show is Samir Bano or Samir Bano. I forgot how you pronounce his name, but you're gonna see, you know, his training form. <laughs> and how bad it was. Um, wait till he does the peck fly. Granted, he's training hard, so he's gonna stimulate. Look at this. Samir, two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Okay, so this is kind of, uh, you know, that's kind of how sloppy most people were training back in the day. And then let's look at Dorian Yates. How much more control, you know, how much, how much more strict his form was than what you would traditionally see back then. I'm going to turn the sound down because we don't need to hear these dudes screaming. So as you can tell, form is a lot better. <laughs> you know, he's holding the contraction. He's actually controlling the weight. Even though I think he's doing, what's he doing? Three, four plates each side. He's controlling it. Again, let's compare kind of what he's doing. This is what's considered slow and controlled versus, you know, what, what this guy was doing. You know, so at the time, you know, the 90s, whatever, when Dorian Yates was competing, that was a strict controlled form. But there's something we learned 
Um, and it all started with, believe it or not, MedX. So the company Dorian Yates recently acquired is MedX. Um, a guy named Dr. Ken Hutchins conducted a study for MedX. And this, the purpose of the study was to see the effect resistance training had on osteoporosis and increasing bone mineral density. So the subjects in this study, they were kind of old, kind of brittle. So what Ken Hutchins decided to do was have them lift and lower the weight very, very slowly so they didn't get hurt. And this is where the super slow guild ended up coming from. So, um, you know, Ken Hutchins instructed them, you know, I could be missing some details, but this is the gist of it. He instructed them to lift and lower the weight for 10 seconds in each direction for this experiment. Now, the results of the experiment were he found that their strength improved tremendously, moving very slowly. Nobody, um, nobody got hurt. So he was able to drastically increase the strength and bone mineral density of these older individuals training slowly. So he realized, huh, moving slowly not only doesn't affect strength gain in a negative way, it seems to have enhanced it in these individuals. And that's kind of where super slow was born. Uh, I believe this was sometime in the 90s. But remember, you know, the communities between the bodybuilding community, between the exercise research community, like Ken Hutchins, MedX, all that kind of stuff, they weren't intertwined. So they learned this after the fact. Now, the super slow guild um, came from Ken Hutchins and he started teaching high intensity training using these really slow training techniques. And there are a lot of... Um, very experienced trainers and teachers and instructors that came out of the super slow guild, you know, uh, Drew Bay, for instance, uh, Adam Zickerman, informed fitness, Dr. Doug McGuff, you know, just to name a few. So the more popular people teaching high intensity training were super slow guild instructors. So they started teaching a more slow repetition cadence. Now, I learned uh, a lot of high-intensity training through these former super slow guild individuals who have since, you know, kind of adjusted their approach a little bit, but they kept the slower repetition cadence from the super slow guild because there's absolutely no denying it's safer. And based on the research and based on um, you know, geez, supervising thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions. It's just as effective. It's safer and more effective. Now, whether or not Dorian Yates learned of this, I, I'm sure he's relatively familiar with super slow. But again, he comes from a different camp. He comes from the bodybuilding high intensity training community. Uh, Mike Menser, although, was aware of super slow. I'm not sure if he really incorporated it. He was a little quick too. But the high intensity training bodybuilders usually incorporated a faster rep cadence because they could they should have gone a little slower, but they could handle it for the most part. But then when you were applying high intensity training to the average Joe, who probably didn't have the injury resistance tolerance of, you know, a, a genetically superior pro bodybuilder. Well, the people who are teaching high intensity training to normal people kind of stayed away from that. So a lot of people wonder why. Menser and Dorian Yates, they train a little bit faster. Well, that's why, because most of the people, most of the people teaching high intensity training now kind of come from the super slow guild or um, are taught by people that are from the super slow guild. Um, and quite honestly, it's correct. It, it's, you know, so if we look at rep cadence, this is uh, what a lot of people recognize about high intensity training is the slow rep cadence. Um, under the, the belief, which isn't wrong, that um, a slow rep cadence is somehow more effective. If intensity of effort is controlled, if everybody trains extremely hard, 
it's all equally effective. But there's a very, very um, low chance of getting injured when you do slower repetition cadences. And this isn't even an anecdote. This is actually, you know, kind of a, a research project of mine. I've supervised, tracked, and recorded over 25,000 sessions in my training studios. And there has not once ever been an injury. If you guys listen to my interview with Marcus Sanovich, he supervised thousands and thousands of training sessions. He, he wasn't even really doing super slow. He was doing slower, but I don't believe he was doing super slow. Um, thousands of sessions with NFL, NCAA football players, never had an injury. Mike Bradley, 22 years at Florida State men's basketball. Never had an injury. So if you're training intensely, um, all results are going to be the same. But more but faster repetitions increase likelihood of injury. That doesn't mean you'll no matter what get injured. Obviously, you know, save your anecdotes about, well, this person trained fast and explosively and he never got hurt. So what? It doesn't make any difference. Okay. That's an anecdote. If you look the vast, at the vast majority of the population, a faster repetition cadence will increase your chance of injury. Will it assure that you'll get injured? No, but it's going to increase it. So that is the purpose for moving slowly. If, for instance, you want to move quickly, go for it. But I have never encountered somebody who's gotten hurt doing a repetition cadence that's give or take five seconds each direction. I've never seen it. I've never encountered somebody. But again, it does kind of come down to preference. Um, so that's kind of where the difference comes from. Um, looks like we got a Samir Banu fan. Um, Kevin Leroy Mupo. Well, listen, I, you know, I'm not into bodybuilding. If I pronounce his name wrong, don't go Karen on me. Um, you know, yeah, Samir Banu, he, you know, maybe he never get injured. Okay. He never got injured, but that doesn't, there are plenty of bodybuilders who did. Okay. So he was lucky. He was lucky. Um, so that's kind of where the difference comes from. That's why I instruct you to train more slowly, but keep in mind, there's really nothing magical about slow repetition cadence other than the reduction in injury. And this comes from shearing forces. Um, I've explained this quite a bit, but I'll do it again. Shearing forces is the pulling force um, where your tendons and ligaments attach to bones. So when my biceps tendon attaches to the bone here and attaches to the muscle here, there's pulling forces between the two. What, and this is called shearing forces. All right, it's just mechanical physics. The heavier the load, the more pulling force between where my tendon attaches at the muscle and at the bone. The more momentum, velocity, the more pulling force. So a lot of times when people get hurt, it's where the tendon attaches to the muscle or the tendon attached to the bone or where the ligament attaches to the bone. And it's due to the shearing forces, due to the pulling force. So it would make sense, logically, to try to reduce this pulling force as much as possible. How do we do this? Move more slowly. And that's all there is to it. Um, what I have noticed, though, when people tend to slow down their reps, it tends to increase the intensity of the exercises for people who haven't done it before. And that increase in intensity produces better results. But if you're training to failure, a three-second cadence versus a 15-second cadence, it's going to be identical. Okay, uh, But that's kind of where the disconnect comes from the way Dorian Yates was training, like Mensah was training, um, and the way I teach you to train. Granted, if you want to train that way, go for it. It's just, it's just an unnecessary increase in the risk of injury. Am I saying you absolutely will get injured? No, I'm not saying that. But you have effectively a zero chance of getting injured if you slow the rep cadence down 
and that just makes more sense, right? So just wanted to cover that. I'm going to answer some questions too. Um, if there are questions I asked like a million times before, or correct, or if there are questions that are answered in the golden era system, I'm probably just going to skip them. I kind of like to answer more nuanced questions, a little more complicated questions. All right, here we go. The form may be sloppy for Samir, but something worked for him to be successful. Okay, genetics, training intensity, drugs. Okay. Again, uh, your response, your, your results don't have anything to do really with the form. It's mostly your genetics and intensity and, you know, then drug use. So that's a very, you know, it's not a very good argument there or whatever. And here we go. When you're genetically blessed, even sloppy, haphazard training will yield the results. Yes. Okay. This is a logical way of looking at this. Is it right for drug users to use this metho methodology? Well, listen to the interview I did with Doran Yates. The, the anabolics, what they do is increase the rate of muscle protein synthesis. What does this do? Increase the rate of recovery, increase the rate of muscle growth, increase the amount of muscle growth, and increases the tolerance of exercise. So an individual using a lot of anabolics can do more exercise, tolerate it, and grow from it. Someone who's not using these drugs has a lower tolerance for exercise and any longer recovery period. So does this work for, for drug users? Well, yeah. <laughs> does it work for non-drug users? Well, yeah, of course it does. So consider Dorian Yates was training about three times a week. His workouts were about 45 minutes long. The majority of the other bodybuilders were training for an hour and a half, six times a week. And Dorian Yates was winning. So what, what, what the anabolics are going to do is, if you have the right genetics, increase your response to exercise. It's also going to increase your tolerance and speed up your recovery. Um, is it right to, to use drugs? Is it right to use drug users? Okay. But that, you know, listen to Dorian Yates, what he says about that. Um, let's see. I get more out of one set of failure. All right. So I get more out of one set of failure versus five sets of 10 with maybe failure in one set. My shoulder doesn't hurt anymore. Exactly. And the reason you're, so first of all, if you're training to failure, the way the nervous system works, and this is irrefutable, and if anyone argues with it, they're just clueless. I mean, it's just the way it is. This is, a, this is a fact. The way the nervous system works is your nervous system will excite more motor neurons, therefore more motor urine, motor units, therefore more muscle fiber based on effort, intensity of effort or intent. So the harder you try, the harder you push, the more muscle fiber is recruited, the more muscle fiber is stimulated. That is why when you train to failure, you get better results. But if you train to failure, you have to reduce your volume because it is more damaging, more fatiguing, more taxing on the nervous system, produces more um, micro trauma. So when people try to train to failure and keep the same volume and frequency, they notice their results suck because they're overtraining. So remember, the, the, the thing that stimulates a muscle to grow is mostly something called mechanotransduction. And simply put, mechanotransduction is a signal sent from mechanosensors to the nucleus of your muscle cell to tell it to grow muscle. And mechanotransduction is achieved by contracting hard, okay? You do not achieve more mechanotransduction signals with more sets, with more reps, with more volume, with more frequency. 
What stimulates this mechanotransduction is an intense muscle contraction. This is why volume is meaningless. So what you do is you try to produce the most intense muscle contraction, and then you fit the volume to accommodate that. Not what most people do, which is I'm going to do this many sets, this many reps, this many exercises, this many days a week, and do what I have to do to get through it. And what do they normally do to get through it? Reduce intensity. Okay. So anything you can do to make an exercise or a workout harder is a step in the right direction for muscle growth. Anything you can do to make it easier or make your workout longer or anything you do to make you able to get more reps or anything you do to allow you to do more weight is a step in the wrong direction. And this is just the physiology of exercise. It just is what it is. Let's see. Smears one guy in early for some of his own person. Sorry, uh... All right, here, here's a question. Um, I recommend this to a lot. Should I start off with two sets and back off when I can no longer recover from it? Um, unless I'm personally taking you through a workout or personally coaching you, I generally recommend someone just go for two sets in the beginning. And... You know, the reason is you're probably not going to train as hard as you could and should be in the beginning. But as time goes on and you gain experience, you're going to be you're going to teach yourself to train harder, in which case you're going to need to reduce the volume. So I do. I have found that this is a good recommendation for people kind of training on their own, because what I find is if you just recommend one set and you're not coaching them, you're not training them. Generally, that one set isn't all that intense and not very effective. All right. I don't know what we're just talking about. All right. All right. Can static hold till failure be considered the same as slow cadence? Yeah, there's no cadence. And that's, that's kind of how you know that you don't, in order to create this mechanotransduction, you don't need weight to move. You just need to contract your muscles intensely. Your mechanosensors or costumers, they sense tension along the sarcomere, uh, along the sarcolemma. They sense tension. And this is what turns on mechanotransduction. With that said, all you got to do is produce tension. I can just contract against the table. If I contract hard enough, I'm going to produce tension on the sarcolemma. The costumers are going to signal this mechanotransduction into the cell and stimulate muscle growth. You don't need movement for that to happen. Most of the reason we do some range of motion and some movement is for the neuromuscular component. Some people, if uh, I would say, you know, many people, if they train just statically, they may not be able to use that strength throughout, you know, a broader range of motion. Um, but this is still up in the air. I don't, I don't know either way. I've had some people who could train with a very short range of motion and exhibit that strength throughout the entirety of the range of motion. And then I've had some people who, if they train in a short range of motion, they only can use that strength within that short range of motion. It's weird. Those are called specific uh, adapters. All right. In your previous video, you talked about how resistance bands are not effective string tools. Well, they're, they're effective. They're just far from ideal. Remember, guys, if you can stimulate your muscle contracting against a table, then you can stimu stimulate your muscle with a resistance band. The belief, however, <laughs> that resistance bands are a good exercise tool is wrong. They're not good. Honestly, a couple milk jugs or a sack of potatoes 
is more effective or, or not more effective, but a better choice. Will resistance bands work? Well, if you use them in a way that causes your muscles to contract really hard and aggressively and deeply fatigue them, of course they'll work. Just like your body weight will work. Just like if you hang a bar from a door frame will work. Um, I've seen uh, Instagram videos of these dudes in Africa just like bench pressing cement blocks. Like anything will work. But uh, what I'm, you know, debunking is the belief that they're a good <laughs> workout tool because they're not. And the reason is resistance bands increase resistance linearly. So if I'm doing a curl with a band, the more I contract, the more resistance I get on the muscle. Some people who don't know any better believe that the strongest position of a muscle is the fully contracted position. This is wrong. Some people believe that the more the muscle contracts, the more force it can produce. Therefore, a resistance band would make sense, right? But this is not how a muscle works. The amount of force a muscle can produce looks kind of more like a more like a bell curve. Weak, weakest in the extended position, strongest somewhere in the middle, and then a little bit weaker up at the top. Okay, but it's not increasingly strong. So I had somebody comment on one of my Instagram videos who believed this, which is wrong. And the reason is, as you reach a fully contracted position, the actinomyosin filaments, while they're normally straight, start to bend like this and kind of bend up against each other. And the actinomyosin cannot cross bridge as well. That's why it's not able to produce as much force. Now, if I'm in a stretch position, the actinomyosin are pulled apart so much that they cannot cross bridge as well. But somewhere in the middle, they're overlapping very well. And the actinomyosin can cross bridge and couple a lot more effectively. So that's why. Um, will resistance bands work? Yes. But what I'm saying is they're not a good tool like people claim. And that's why. Ideally, you'd want some kind of exercise that produces the most resistance somewhere in the middle of the range of motion. Um, and again, where your muscles produce what's called peak muscle torque, that strongest position in the range of motion, it, it varies between exercises. So with a biceps curl, it's basically 90 degrees elbow flexion. With a lateral raise, somewhere in the middle. With a leg press, um, it's about 270 degrees of knee flexion or knee, ex uh, knee flexion or knee extension, whichever. So it kind of varies between exercises. But um, Nautilus and MedX, again, the you know uh, Dorian Yates recently acquired MedX, and a lot of the reason is the equipment is so damn good. It accommodates the changing muscle torque curve of your body because these the equipment is is. Uh, designed in a way to increase or decrease resistance based on where you are in the range of motion. So that's why resistance bands. And of course, you know, you know, we're talking about Instagram, TikTok, whatever. That's why, you know, resistance bands are stupid. You guys got to remember, I got to play the game. <laughs> you know, it's, you know, it's a weird attention thing. If I want people to, to, to hear my information, it's kind of it kind of has to be designed in kind of a controversial way um, to get people to watch it. And you know, for all the people who say, "Well, why don't you just you know just you know, remain true to yourself and stay genuine?" And blah 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 blah. Listen, guys, if I want to spread proper exercise information and I got to play the game, I'm going to play the game. The reason high intensity training is not popular is because. Um, in the past, people didn't play the game. They didn't make their reels and Instagrams like catchy to get people to watch. You know, um, you know, it's society's fault. Your attention span is about three seconds. So um, that's why you know, do things like resistance bands are stupid. Stop doing. You know, keep in mind, guys. I have an editor that gives me the titles. <laughs> I don't come up with the titles. Um, I, basically, what I do for my Instagram reels. And TikToks and whatever is post them. You know, I, everything is pretty much pre-recorded, sent over, edited. I just post them. 
I don't do the title, whatever. So sometimes, you know, a video will seem like I say like, oh, uh, resistance bands are the worst things in the world. Well, no, it's just edited in a way to get people to watch it. So that way they're exposed to other, you know, good information. So if I, you know, if I stuck to, you know, if I was here sitting around talking like Ken Hutchins, you know, I'd have 11 followers. <laughs> it's the way it is, man. It's the way it is. Got to play the game. Okay, let's see. If someone's collarbone hurts when they lift laterally overhead, doing hit hit help them. Well, kind of, obviously, it's going to depend on what is causing that pain. Um, but I would recommend avoiding anything that hurts it. Um, if your collarbone hurts, man, this, that could be a gazillion different things. Um, but yes, high-intensity training the way I teach it will not only pretty much eliminate your chance of injury, I've noticed a lot of times with my clients, it gets rid of them. So it gets rid of injuries. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, you got to try it, man. I mean, uh, if you have any sort of twinge, injury, nagging injury, nagging pain, this method of training is not the best option. It's the only option. The other options are going to hurt you eventually if you got a nagging injury. So uh, really, this is it's kind of the only way to go at this point. My buddy who lifts four to five days a week doesn't buy that it takes me four to five days before I can lift again. But he won't try once that's a failure workout. He doesn't believe it because he's comparing it to the way he works out. All right, this is the this is the big uh, confusion. It's you know when you say you know I only you know train a couple times a week. My workouts are like thirty minutes. I do one set. They can't believe it. It's because mentally they're comparing what you're telling them to what they do in the gym, which is not the same thing. The way we perform a set, the way a proper high intensity training set is performed, is with huge amounts of intensity with a pretty long set duration. Consider, you know, a uh, one set of high intensity training could be 60 to 120 seconds of continuous significant muscular loading. That would be equivalent to like five sets for most people. Okay, so when you you can't really explain this to people all that well, you have to show them. You have to take them through a workout. That's the only way they're going to get it, um, because otherwise they're just going to compare it to what they've been doing in the gym. And guys, you know, we know what we've seen. Yeah, he says find a smarter buddy. <laughs> well, guys, consider I mean, you know, both of my best friends growing up. Um, one of them he continues to do his own thing. The other one does what I taught him. You know, again, like if an individual likes going to the gym, if it's part of who they are, it's, I don't, you should not try to change them. Okay. So if somebody is a fitness guy or a fitness girl, and that's part of their hobby, it's part of what they like to do. They like to go to the gym. They like all this part of what they do. Save your high intensity lecture. <laughs> don't don't give them a high intensity lecture. Hold on one second. Um, save the high intensity lecture. Don't lecture people who are fitness enthusiasts if they like it. If it's something they do, it's, it's a waste of your time. Don't change them. It's what they like. It's, it's their life. However, if you meet individuals who um, say they can't find the time to work out, or you meet individuals who keep hurting themselves themselves in the gym, individuals who are overweight and that's becoming like a really it's a health problem, those are the people you give the old high intensity training lecture to, okay? But people who identify with working out with the gym, whatever, just don't leave them alone. Leave them alone. I mean, you know, 
when I go to the gym, I see people doing crazy shit all the time. I don't know. Unless they ask for help, it's none of your business. Let them. Um, although in the fitness community, if I see influencers or coaches <laughs> teaching stuff that is wrong and dangerous, yeah, I'm going to step in. Okay. This um, common question. My biceps fail before my back does. Seeing as I take every set to failure, I'm unsure if this is an imbalance will ever go away. So your biceps are actually not failing before your back does. And this is going to sound, you know, and, and, and it would make sense that they were unless you knew this. You have more sensory input, more pain sensory input, nerve endings in your biceps, your forearms, your shoulders, than you do in the muscles of your back. So it feels like your biceps are failing before your back does because there are more sensory nerve endings in your arms. And that's why you have that sensation. But your biceps are not failing before your back is. You just feel your biceps more because of the amount of pain receptors in your biceps. <laughs> you know, um, consider like, you know, when you get a tattoo, you know, where do, where do tattoos, you know, hurt the most? They hurt kind of like on the arms, the inside of the arms. What, you know, why would a, a tattoo hurt more on the inside of your arm than say the middle of your back? Why is it more painful? It's because of pain receptors. And the same thing holds true for training. So they're not failing. They just feel that way. Is doing three drops as the failure without a rest between them considered one set? Yeah, that's considered one. That's called a, a, a set extender as a drop set. Um, could that be overkill? Yeah, usually is. Um, three drop sets usually overkill. In your opinion, why do you think lower volume, high intensity training is not catching on mainstream? A couple of reasons. One, what most people are taught in terms of exercise comes from NASM, ACSM, NSCA, etc. And most of what they teach is not substantiated by any evidence. So they're providing the curriculum in universities, personal training certifications, etc. But most of what they're providing um, in their curriculum is mostly opinion. And most of it is not substantiated by any evidence. So the reason what most people do is mainstream is because of where they learn this information, not realizing that where they learn this information is complete bullshit. And I've gone over a couple of times in the live streams, a paper by Ralph Carpinelli and Robert Otto debunking the recommendations that um, ACSM provides for exercise in, in proving that none of their recommendations actually have any evidence. Okay. That's part of the reason. Number two, uh, people avoid discomfort. People do not like discomfort. Higher intensity, lower volume training is very uncomfortable. People don't want, people won't want to do it. All right. Number three, it's not very sexy. It's not very interesting. You know, you know, bouncing a medicine ball off of your head while standing on a BOSU ball is interesting to watch for most people. But doing one slow repetition cadence to failure is boring as shit to watch. So it's just not very fun to watch. <laughs> and when it comes to, you know, training like this, I mean... Is, is kind of basic. Once you understand the principles, I mean, mainstream fitness will come out with a new workout. You know, you got like Jeff Cavalier, that fucking idiot 
coming out with a new workout every day with some crazy anatomy bullshit. But with high intensity training, once you get the basics down, you're, you're done. You're done for life. There's nothing else you need to learn. <laughs> you know. But the, the fitness industry will have you on this hamster wheel trying all new workouts. Jeff Cavalier comes up with this functional bullshit fucking outer, middle, deep, superficial biceps exercise for the middle, outer, underhead. And then people will buy into it. So that's a lot of the reason. Um, the fitness industry is an industry there to kind of sell you stuff. And if they can just create more crap all the time, the industry works better. If high intensity, low volume, just simple training was the mainstream approach, there really wouldn't be anything else to sell. There would be no Jeff Cavalier. What would he do? He's got nothing else to make up and sell you. How does adaptive thermogenesis change as you age? I have no idea. Good question. Does it change as you age? Maybe. I bet adapt. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I would say it does. But how does it? I don't know. Man. I don't know. How do you get 160 grams of protein in a deficit? Unlimited to 1,600 label calories. Um, 180 grams of protein is going to be less than 800 calories. So it's going to be what? 720? It's going to be 720 calories. It's not. That's how. <laughs> I understand the question. Uh, protein sources are high in calories usually. No, they're not. No, they're not. Um, well, if, if you're eating things like beef, salmon, yeah, that is why chicken became so, um, popular in bodybuilding because it's, there's no fat. It's just pure protein. So the best way to get, you know, all that protein, protein shakes, chicken, white fish, lean ground Turkey, like 99% lean ground Turkey. That's how you do it. Um, shakes. Yeah. I mean, it's it's probably the uh, source of protein you're using. If you're if you're eating a lot of beef, it's going to be beef's got a lot more fat in it, so you're going to get less bang for your buck in terms of the calorie to protein ratio. Let's see. All right, I've been weight training for thirty years. Nice. Been doing hip for almost a year now, going very well, but my weight is staying the same at one sixty five. 48. What's the best way to add more muscle? The best way to add more muscle is to join my private coaching, my private coaching group. There's a link in the description. Click the link, book a call with me, and join my coaching. Because when you reach um, kind of a plateau in muscle building, you're going to need an expert to watch what you're doing and dial things in with you and dial things in for you. Because there's not going to be a general recommendation to overcome that plateau. We have to see what is the rate limiting factor in your muscle growth. What is it? Is it the intensity? Is it the protein intake? Is it the calories? Is it the extra activity? Is it the stress? Is it your genetics? Is it your nagging, annoying wife? Who knows? So you need to join coaching if you want to get past that plateau. There's a link in the description for that. And that goes for anybody, too. If anybody wants the absolute best gains possible, you got to join my coaching because there's a lot more you need to learn. Um, I cover the basics of it you know, in golden era in my content. But in coaching, there's a lot more you're going to need to know about this to unlock, uh, to unlock the absolute potential your body needs. Will you get great results just following the basic recommendations? Yes, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get the absolute best results your body is capable of. That is what the coaching is for. So if you guys have hit a plateau or if you guys um, are so ambitious and so motivated that you want the absolute best results as fast as possible, join my coaching and we will get you there. Is it likely for elderly or sick people to have a heart attack during the workout? No. And it comes down to uh, 
uh, something called venous return. So when you are weight training, you are pumping. So um, your cardiovascular system includes your muscles as a pump for blood as well. We all know our heart is a pump. But guess what? Our muscles also pump blood back into our heart during contraction. So when you're weight lifting, your muscles contract so hard that they squeeze blood back up into your heart and increases the amount of blood that goes into your heart and out of your heart. It's called stroke volume, increases the stroke volume, which makes resistance training because of this increase in stroke volume and this additional help as your muscles pumping blood back in makes strength training the safest activity for your heart. Doug McGuff, um, he told a story once about he had a client that had a bad heart condition. And it would be difficult for the client to even get into his studio because of his heart condition. But as soon as he got on a machine and started training, his heart condition went away. I can't remember the specific heart condition. But it went away while he was training because of the increased stroke volume. Um, so no, proper resistance training is not dangerous for anybody. It's, it's like the safest thing you could do. You know, contracting your muscles hard is not dangerous. Contracting your muscles hard with high momentum, now that can be dangerous. Let's see, YouTube channel, 3D Alpha is posting studies and commuting, claiming that one set of failure is wrong. Well, here's the thing. There are some studies that claim that volume, more volume or more sets is more effective for muscle growth. But the majority, the vast majority of all the studies ever done comparing one set, three sets, etc., conclude that one set to failure and three sets are similar in muscle growth. That doesn't mean there aren't some out there that claim to show that more volume is better. I'm talking about the majority. So consider this. If I asked 100 people, if they like the color red better or the color blue better. And 90 out of the 100, out of the 100 people said they like the color red better than the color blue. And only 10 out of that 100 said they prefer blue. You would say the majority of people prefer the color red, right? 90 out of 100 prefer red. 10 out of 100 prefer blue. What the volume training community does is... Basically say that, okay, well, 90 people out of 100 like red. Oh, but 10%, 10 people like blue, so everybody likes blue. That's what they're doing. We're talking about the majority of the literature. If the majority, if there's a, a statistical majority, that's what you have to go by. You know, the majority of exercise literature comparing single and multiple sets shows no difference in muscle growth. I don't care what the guy says. Alexander Bromley. Uh, I'm mildly familiar with that guy, but if you want to take training advice from a bald dude that looks like my big toe, you go for it. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> go for it. You want to take training advice for him? I mean, what's his credentials? I've supervised over 20,000 workouts. I'm a published fitness model. I'm a published author, a published speaker. I can use the word published 400 fucking times. What is he? Just some bald fat dude? You want to take fitness advice from him? Go. I'd, I'd probably take advice from the guy who supervised 25,000 sessions, owned two gyms, is a published author in medical magazines. Published model? I'd probably take that guy's advice. Um, but it's up to you. It's up to you. I wouldn't take um, wealth management advice from a homeless person. But if you are listening to this Alex Bromley dude for training advice, it's akin to taking wealth management advice from a homeless person because he's a, he's a turd. Consider, like, who would you rather look like, me or him? 
if you're a power lifter, he kind of looks like he's a power lifter. Um, then yeah, power lifting advice. But it, the dude has no fucking clue what he's talking about. I haven't watched any of his videos, but the fact that he's arguing, uh, he's just uh, he's just a fucking idiot. <laughs> I'll tell you. Let's see. Let's see what I'm <laughs> we need some gorgeous Victoria's Secret supermodels doing hit to make it social media sexy. Yeah, imagine like there's a Victoria's Secret model doing this shit. But again, like it wouldn't get that popular um, because let's be honest, guys, it's a little boring. Powerlifting is a lot more interesting to watch. Um, bodybuilding is a lot more interesting to watch. This stuff's boring. To be honest, I mean, I think, you know, I think that the science and the anatomy and the physiology behind it is interesting, but not everybody likes that. Most people just want, tell me what to do, and I'm, then I'm going to go do it. Most people don't want all this sciencey stuff. Um, you know, Olympic lifting, power lifting, that shit is fun to watch. That's why it's more appealing. This stuff is not. <laughs> Let's see. What's your recommendation for rest using hit? Um, so Lamont Billings, go ahead and get the golden error system because I answer all these questions in that system. Um, it sounds like you still need to be taught kind of the basics of high intensity training and that system teaches all the basics. I don't go over the basics really on live streams because I've beaten that horse into friggin' hamburger meat at this point. Um, so get the golden error system. I have videos that, that go over all. Chicken and eggs are really expensive these days. Uh, yeah, eggs kind of are. But chicken's not, dude. Like, you know, if you go to a grocery store, I see at the local grocery store, you're going to get you know, five pounds of chicken for like 12 bucks. If you get the big packages, you get like five chicken breasts that are over a pound each for like 10, 12 bucks. Go to Walmart. Walmart, uh, chicken is, if you buy chicken in the big packages at Walmart, I think it's, Two ninety nine a pound or one eighty nine a pound or something like crazy low, and then just prepare it, freeze it. You know, it's it's really not that expensive. Um, when I was, you know, when I was twenty five and I was just like, I want to build the most muscle possible, and I was dieting perfectly. I, I was spending twenty dollars a week on groceries, <laughs> so. You know, the, the belief that dieting is expensive is wrong. I think it's an excuse because I was 25 years old living in a dumpy apartment before I really st This was actually right when I started teaching hit um, in a studio. And I was jacked off 20 bucks a week. Rice, chicken, uh, ground turkey, ground beef. I used to eat grits in the morning, oatmeal. Eggs were cheap back then. They're not, you know, that, that cheap now, but whatever. Personally, I don't even eat eggs. I'm so sick of them. Good exercises for my biceps. Go to goldenerasystem.com. You're getting the advanced arm program free with it. That is going to give you a bunch of good exercises for your biceps. And so I'm not going to answer that. I'm going to make you go get the system. Um, video demonstrations of six or seven exercises for your biceps. Go get it. Why doesn't it seem like there are more women watching these videos? Um, because I think it's me. <laughs> because I'm like a muscular guy, so guys who want to get muscular kind of gravitate towards my stuff. Women, not so much. Uh, women are going to watch other women generally for fitness advice and men are going to watch other men. I highly doubt any of you guys in here go to like a woman's Instagram or YouTube and follow their training advice. We we tend to like kind of stay with our genders for the most part. Um, but I have women, and what is weird is that in my studios, 80% of my clients are women. 
like most, most of my clients in my studios were women. And they respond so well, it's insane. And I can say this, uh, in general, women have stronger lower bodies than men. They do. Men's upper bodies are much, much stronger than women's on average, like not even close. But women's lower bodies are a little bit stronger than men's on average. It's something I observed. I need you to collab with V-Shred. You know, I'm trying to figure out what V-Shred is. Is it, you know, I don't think it's, I think it's a company that uses his face. I think he's just like an actor for some ridiculous company. Um, there's no way he's behind all that shit. It's just so stupid. Do you think that Nautilus machines are more effective in training in hit fashion than in comparison to other equipment? Yes. Well, high intensity training came out of Nautilus, came from Arthur Jones. Arthur Jones is the founder of Nautilus. And um, him and Ellington Darden coined the term high intensity training. But um, Arthur Jones was responsible for kind of popularizing a more intense, lower volume training approach. And Arthur Jones was the founder of Nautilus. So believe it or not, uh, Nautilus equipment was designed to be used this way. Um, yeah, Ellington Darden is kind of selling out. He's gotten a little weird. The dude's like 80. Just keep trying to come up with books. Um, Ellington Darden's older books are great. Love them. Entertaining. The training information is going to be redundant based on what you learn here. Um, but I like his books. The newer books, no, I, w I wouldn't. Been training for five years, 5'10", 185. That's a good size. 15% body fat. Just train, just started hit. What kind of gains do you think I can get in a year? You could add 10 to 15 pounds of muscle in a year. Um, it depends. Are you, you've been training for five years. Um, you know, it's tough to say. Um, really tough to say if you're a beginner you're gonna add 10 15 20 pounds of muscle um but if you're a trained a trained individual which you are you're gonna add muscle how much who the hell knows there's a, like i said there's a lot of thing that a lot of things that go into it tons of aspects that go into it well see there is well, the newer Nautilus brand of machines are bullshit. <laughs> the older Nautilus and like the Nautilus Nitro machines, there is something special about them. And what's special about them is that they're built with a cam. They have a cam which varies the resistance. Need to come up with a debate discussion for both camps. You know... <laughs> It's like, do we though? <laughs> do we do we need to debate? Um, anyone I've ever debated on volume, they can't hang. Where where the debate ends up when I start debating people on volume, they they don't because I'll start talking about costumiers, mechanotransduction, myofibrillar proliferation ribosomes. I'll, I'll, listen, I will pop off about that sciencey shit. They can't. They cannot. They just get out of here. This is what they do. When I start popping off about the sciencey shit, you know what they do? Well, all the top bodybuilders train with volume. Explain that. Well, if this works so well, then everyone would do it. So whenever you debate, debate a volume person, they don't actually know what the fuck they're talking about. So when you start actually talking about the mechanisms behind muscle growth and the physiology, they just resort to a stupid fallacy, like the bandwagon fallacy. And they just say, well, if it works so well, then why wouldn't everyone do it? I don't fucking know. Why is everyone fat? If being skinny, if being thin... Allows you to live longer, 
then why is the most of Western culture fat? That's not an argument. It's not a debate. That's a cop out. That's avoiding a debate. So I don't even like debating any of these volume people anymore because I'm going to talk circles around them when it comes to the physiology of muscle growth. And you know what they're going to do? Well, if it works so well, why doesn't everyone do it? It's just not going to go anywhere. It's just, you know, it's stupid. They're not, they are not prepared. They are not prepared. I, you know, I will bury them into the fucking ground um, when it comes to debating exercise. But the thing is, I don't need to. If you want to do volume, do volume. But if you come out here saying that high intensity training is some kind of sham, then I'm going to bury you into the ground with physiology. So I'll debate someone who does that. So remember, guys, I, it was like last summer. A friend of mine was talking to some guy he knew who said he was a he studied exercise at Harvard. That's what he said. Harvard doesn't have a fucking exercise physiology program. So <laughs> complete bullshit. And he was telling my friend how everything I was saying is wrong. So what I did was me and Drew Bay did a video ripping apart every critique this guy had and every point he made trying to support the fact that I was wrong. Me and Drew Bay took it point by point by point and dismantled it. And guess what happened after that? That guy never said anything again for the rest of his life. <laughs> he never said anything back. Me and Drew dismantled his claim so bad in that video, he never said anything again. Do you want to know why? Because he had nothing to say. Notice I don't mention the guy's name. I don't mention anybody's name because what we're doing here is we're talking about training. We're talking about ideas. We're not talking about people. I'm not talking about Greg Doucette or Mike O'Hearn or, you know, I did mention somebody earlier, but he's just a, you know, he's just a fat turd. So I kind of wanted to mention him. Um, but no, you know, and what's the point of debating people? You know, what we'll do, you know, if someone has points, we'll go over the points and I will dismantle them. Um, and not give recognition to the person who made the points. Because a lot of the times these people just kind of want YouTube exposure or social media exposure. So I'm not giving it to them. Fuck off. Or, you know, I, I posted videos almost every day for like two years to build a YouTube channel. I'm not giving some idiot. Let's see. Yeah. See, Drew's here. We don't need to debate them. We need to educate them. I don't argue with people who know far less about the subject and don't understand it nearly as well. I educate them. See, that's a good approach. And Drew, Drew taught me that. Like, you know, my immature self, I just wanted to, you know, rip people apart. But it's, it's just not worth it. Let's see. I'm going to go over a couple more questions that are, like Drew said, educational. Like, you know, and that's the thing. I pick questions on here that is going to teach people things. You know, I'm not really going to cover the basics, um, you know, because, man, I've got thousands and thousands of um, videos on here covering the basic stuff. Let's see. Hmm. Questions, questions. Sorry, guys. I'm just trying to just trying to pick one question that is going to, you know, that's kind of a good topic that we haven't covered. Like, for instance, this question, you know, how do you bulk and cut? We've, we've covered that a lot. Joy Pass, why don't you click the link in my description? 
um, book a call with me to learn about my coaching because uh, it sounds like you need a little more specific, direct help. Um, a lot of your questions can't be answered in, with a general answer. They're, they're kind of specific. Darius. Train with Jay Vincent's hit program. Gain five kilos of muscle in 15 to 20 minute workouts every five days. Oh, you missed progress photo? Thanks, dude. Hell yeah. Darius Wright. Um, all right, here we go. We'll answer one question. All right, this will be a good one. This guy looks like a fucking chat. Look at him. You should be teaching hit. All right, let's see. Last question. Remember, guys, home workout arm program free. With Golden Era System today, go to goldenerasystem.com. Remember, you may not get access immediately to the free programs. I have to go through sporadically throughout the day and grant access. Um, so I'll do it a couple times before midnight, and then I'll do it all tomorrow morning. So if you don't get your access to the free programs today, you will have access to it tomorrow morning. It doesn't happen automatically. I got to go in and do it. And I kind of check throughout the day, and I go and I add access throughout the day. So... And if I miss you for some reason, if you don't get, if it's been a couple of days, you don't get access to the free program, just email me. I may have missed you and then I'll, I'll give you access. Okay. All right. Last question. What is the cheapest simple way to get 180 grams of protein a day? Um, let's go over. It. Well, like I said, you know, in a lot of grocery stores, it depends on where you live, of course. <clears throat> um, if you buy chicken in large packages, it gets quite cheap. $3 a pound tops, usually less. All right. So let's start by that. Um, I remember them being like, I don't really buy chicken like that anymore. But I remember them being packages of five chicken breasts. It was about five pounds and being about $10. All right. You buy two of those a week, you are set. 20 bucks right there in protein. Um or just one of those. <laughs> um, ground turkey, lean ground turkey is about $4.99 a pound for 90% lean ground turkey or even 99% lean ground turkey. So we got ground turkey, chicken breasts. Ground beef it comes with a lot of fat. Uh, usually, even if you get really lean ground beef, you're going to be paying like, you know, six fifty, seven bucks a pound for it. Not really worth it. Eggs are expensive now. Not so great. Um, certain kinds of white fish can be cheap. I think tilapia is cheap. But honestly, you're, be, you're best off going with chicken and ground beef. Or ground turkey. Chicken or ground turkey. That's going to be the most bang for your buck. Most protein per dollar. Lowest in calories. All right. And then you're going to, you know, you're going to eat some carbohydrates, sweet potatoes, other vegetables, even some white potatoes, white rice, brown rice, pretty cheap. You know, you get a big old thing of rice uh, to put in your rice cooker. It's like three bucks. It'll, that, that'll last you a whole week. You know, back, you know, this was, you know, 2015, I was spending 20 bucks a week on groceries. But, you know, nowadays you're probably spending, you know, 30. It's not bad. Not bad. <clears throat> whey protein too. Um, when it comes to whey protein, guys, just get whatever's cost effective. You don't need, so some companies will try to sell you a more expensive whey protein, trying to convince you that it's got these amino acids or this or that or all this other bullshit in it. It's nonsense. Just get, you know, optimum nutrition, Muscle Tech, um, the GNC brand protein. Um, I like All Max. Uh, mostly, I get Optimum Nutrition. Just basic protein. It should be you know thirty bucks. Don't be fooled by all that expensive stuff. Um, you know, isolate or concentrate doesn't matter. See, this is the this is that crap that they introduce to get you to think that there's a difference between whey isolate whey isolate and whey concentrate it's all the same guys it's all the same protein 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 gold standard yeah this is this is what i get man i, I love it this is what i get 
gold standard way, you know, just don't overthink the protein. Don't overthink. Don't overthink anything. When it comes to training, don't overthink. Keep it simple. Push your body really hard. Train really intensely. Rest a lot. And move slow. Okay? That's it for me today, guys. Until next time, again, you get three programs today, goldenairsystem.com. If you guys want my direct help um, to work with me personally, we do two group calls every week, and they're like three hours long, where I coach you guys in person, live, every week. And I record all the calls, and we dial in your training. We dial in your nutrition. Everything is handled with you and me, one-on-one, and in a group setting. There's a link in my description for that. All right. Hit like, subscribe. And if you guys could, I'm sharing, um, I'm opening a weight loss clinic down here in Tampa. I'm going to be creating social media profiles, focusing on weight loss, nutrition, that kind of stuff. Okay. So the Jay Vincent stuff is going to be mostly training and building muscle. My other business, which is going to be a weight loss clinic, hormone therapy, all that kind of stuff. We're going to focus on weight loss. So I'm going to be producing content in like weight loss just overall health, nutrition, that kind of stuff. Um, the account was called Exceptional Health Tampa. So follow me on Instagram. I might do a YouTube channel, but I'm kind of separating what I talk about on each page. So if you guys are interested in fat loss, more nutrition stuff, more hormone stuff, more of that sciencey, sciencey stuff, um, Exceptional Health Tampa on Instagram and Exceptional Health Tampa Facebook. All right. Um, where can you find the video? You and Drew did dismantling all the points. Um, just go to my YouTube videos, type in J Vincent Drew Bay. Okay. Um, yeah. Please enter the nutrition game. So much misinformation going on. I'm going to, um, but it's going to be kind of separate from what I do here. Um, personally, I'm not really interested in nutrition, but it seems, you know, there is a, a huge demand for it. So we'll be debunking it. Okay. Okay. Um, so um, I'll see you guys in a couple days. Like, subscribe, goldenairsystem.com. See you next time.